turn this morning to Psalm 68, verses 1 and 2. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Well, this psalm was probably written when David moved the Ark of the Covenant from the house of Obed-Edom up to the hill of Zion in Jerusalem. And these two verses are borrowed from Numbers chapter 10 and verse 35. And so there's an immediate lesson for us here in prayer. It's often helpful for us to borrow the language of Scripture. And we use Scripture prayers, and we make them our own, and we apply them to our own situations. If you read the book of Jonah, Jonah's prayer in Jonah chapter 2 is full of Scripture, and we can understand why. He was in the belly of that fish. His life was in turmoil. I suggest to you he hardly knew what to think and how to express himself before the Lord. But there was enough of Scripture in Jonah's heart to arm him with the language of prayer. And sometimes when we are going through difficult times, people have come to me and they say, Pastor, I hardly know how to pray. When you do not know how to pray, then go to the Scriptures and mine the verses of Scripture, and use them. Make them your own. Psalm 119 is full of short prayers. Meditate upon those verses. Not necessarily all 176, but take one or two. Look at the prayers of David there and say, that's how I feel. That's what I need the Lord to do for me. And make those prayers our own. Well, David speaks here by inspiration concerning the glorious kingdom of Jesus Christ. His advance and the establishing of his reign and his kingdom in this world. We know that from verse 18. We didn't read it, but look at verse 18. It will be familiar to some of us. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also. This verse is quoted in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. And the apostle, by inspiration, tells us it speaks of Christ. And so we know that this whole psalm is Christological. It tells us of his victory over his enemies and the establishing of his kingdom here in verses 1 and 2. Now one final thought before we come to some of the detail of this psalm. This psalm is what we call, or could call, a processional psalm. It wasn't written to be sung necessarily in the temple. It would have been sung by the procession as they took up the ark and as they carried it up to Zion's Hill in Jerusalem. Because there are some that use psalms like this. In verse 25, we read of the, the damsels playing with timbrels, tambourines. And people say, well, we can have those things in our church. Look, it's there in the psalm. There's the biblical warrant and example. But we have to remember that Israel was not only a picture of the church. It was also a nation under God. And there were festivals and there were national celebrations and events. And they acknowledged the Lord in those events. And when they had a procession, they didn't necessarily mean that everything in that procession, the dancing and the shouting, should be part and parcel of temple worship where God was at the center of everything? No. 
So we understand that as we look at those verses in this psalm and others. Well, I want to notice then to begin with that this psalm is both a triumph. It is a celebration of praise to the Lord for his conquests and for his goodness and his acts. But it is also a prayer. And so the first thing we have to notice is that in verses 1 and 2, there is a prayer against the enemies of the Lord's people. And we may say, well, aren't we supposed to pray for our enemies according to the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, we are. We pray for our enemies, but we pray against their designs. And whoever raises themselves as an enemy of Christ and his church, we may pray against all that they intend on all they, that they stand for. We pray that they will be disarmed. We pray that their hearts may be opened and that though they perhaps have been the greatest rebels against Christ and his truth, that they will be humbled and brought to acknowledge him like the Apostle Paul Yet we, we, we still play, pray against the enemies of God and his church. In 1644, a preacher called Thomas Case, a Puritan, preached before the Houses of Parliament. Would that there were good men who had opportunity to preach in Parliament today, as Thomas Case preached in 1644. And he preached on these two verses. And the title of his sermon was God's Rising, His Enemies Scattering. And he had six points that he made from these first two verses. I'm going to borrow them because they are most helpful. And his first heading is that the church of God will always have enemies. We know that. All through the scriptures. The people of God had enemies. The Egyptians, the Midianites, the Philistines, the Amalekites, the Babylonians. In the New Testament, there were those that persecuted the church of Jesus Christ. Herod, the Roman Empire, the Jewish authorities. The church has always had its enemies. Satan is the arch enemy of the church. And if we are part of the church of Jesus Christ, we realize, we must realize that there are enemies who hate us. Satan at the forefront. Every soldier is a target. And the greater our zeal, the greater our love, the more holy our walk, the more will be Satan's hatred towards us and his desire to cause us to stumble, then how often we need to pray that the Lord should be our keeper and that he should preserve us and that he should embolden us to stand against all that Satan seeks to do. But Satan is not our only enemy. There are many people who are enemies of the cause of God, the church of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 18, Paul says, Many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And sadly, some of those who are the greatest enemies of the church will make a profession of faith. They will say, we are Christians. We belong to the church. We stand for God and Christ, and yet they will speak perverse things to draw away disciples after them. There will be those that persecute as well as those that teach error, and there will be those who promote themselves and cause great strife and division amongst the people of God. I'm telling you this because so often we hear of Christians, particularly young Christians, who are greatly discouraged and offended when they come into the life of the church 
and then they experience trouble and confusion and opposition. Many are the enemies of the church, and many will be the troubles and the upheavals that the people of God experience in this world. And we must expect it. We are soldiers of Christ, and there will be great attempts to destabilize the church, to destroy her testimony, and to undermine her confidence in God. Young Christian, are you ready to enlist in the army? Are you ready to make yourself an enemy of this world and an enemy of Satan? Are you ready to stand steadfast to Christ, even though it may lead you into much trouble and heartache? You will be criticized. You will be falsely accused, said the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be led before councils and authorities. But this is the way. Let God arise, says this, uh, this verse. Let his enemies be scattered. The second heading Thomas Case gives is this. The church's enemies are God's enemies. We read here, let his enemies be scattered. The church's enemies are God's enemies. What a comfort it is to know that the Lord, the Lord of hosts, is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Zechariah, through the, the Lord through the prophet Zechariah said, Whoso toucheth you, toucheth the apple of his eye. Such is God's jealousy, his holy jealousy, over the church. That ought to encourage us, especially when we feel embattled in this world. Some of you would have seen the short video of a faithful man of God, a preacher. I've met him. I've spoken to him. He's a good man, John Sherwood. And yesterday, preaching in Uxbridge, he was arrested and detained overnight for preaching. He said nothing that was particularly controversial. He simply, I, sus I suspect when asked, alleged that God made only two genders, man and woman. There are many who are enemies of Christ in this world, and they will do all they can to cause us trouble. But our enemies, if we are faithful to the Lord, they are God's enemies too. Remember what happened when Saul went to Damascus to arrest Christians? The Lord met him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He wasn't persecuting Christ, was he? He most certainly was. Because his hand was raised against the church to hail men and women to prison. Have you ever made yourself an enemy of God? If we despise the people of God and the gospel that they preach, we make ourselves the enemy of God. And that's a solemn thing. But God has made us more than conquerors through him that loved us. I remember some years ago, someone said, you can summarize the book of Revelation very easily in one sentence. I said, what's that? He said, the book of Revelation declares there is a war and Christ is going to win. And you can't argue with that. That is, in a sense, is the testimony of that final book. God will arise. His enemies will be scattered. And those who are on the side of Christ will be more than conquerors. The third heading is that God sometimes seems to sleep or to lie still and let his enemies and the haters of the gospel do what they will for a season. That's implied here, he says in this verse. Let God arise. He's laying, he's sleeping, and he needs to arise. Why does God sometimes allow the enemies of the church to have what seems to be 
free reign. To act with great arrogance and pride and audacity. Uh, to do such harm. To act with such revenge and cruelty against the people of God. Well, he is sovereign. And for a time, he may. Psalm 2 says, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. He will only need to speak, and they will be had in derision. But the Lord does. It may be to make us pray. It may be that through the troubles that the churches face, the enemy's cruelty, his church is sanctified, is refined. Those that are dead wood, false professors, are weeded out. Even those who are true are polished in their character. Why did the Lord allow the Babylonians to take away the Jews into captivity? It was because they had backslidden. It was because they were fraternizing with idolatry. And the Lord chastened them. And sometimes the Lord does allow even the enemies, his enemies, and the enemies of the church to, uh, to act in great cruelty. And it is to prove those who are his genuine people. Fourthly, there is a time when God will arise, says Thomas Case. There are times, and we see them noted down the pages of history, when God has arisen for his people's good, to defend them, to prosper them, to grant the gospel such remarkable advance that many enemies are confounded and silenced. And the cause of Christ rides triumphant. We saw it at the time of the Reformation. When papal Rome dominated and held sway over the minds of almost the whole of Europe. And yet, in the mercy of God, through men like Martin Luther, and I must apologize I got something wrong last week when I referred to Martin Luther. He nailed those theses to the door of the castle at Wittenberg in 1517. But it was in 1521 that he was, his books were finally declared heresy. So we think of that time. But that was the beginning of a time when God arose in mighty power and raised up men and equipped and enabled them to preach the truth, to translate the scriptures, to go throughout Switzerland, Germany, the British Isles, and many other parts of Europe. And the word of Christ was known. And many were liberated from that superstitious hold of papal Rome and came to know the glories of Christ. It was an hour of great triumph, the fulfillment of these verses. It happened in the Roman Empire. Who would think that by the time of Constantine, the Roman Empire would yield and one of its emperors would declare that the, uh, the religion of the empire would be Christianity. It was the same empire that had fed Christians to the lions put them in nets to be mauled by brute beasts. And yet within two or three centuries, things so changed. The Lord is able to confound his enemies. We read of the death of tyrants, Herod, who had ordered the slaughter of James, who had imprisoned Peter, cut down in a moment, lost his life. He can influence the heart of any ruler. We think of when Paul was at Corinth and the Jews whipped up opposition to his preaching and they hauled one of Paul's accomplices before Gallio, the governor. And Gallio cared for none of their accusations and drove them from the judgment seat. The Lord is able to uphold and sustain his people he is able to arise and he has arisen and does arise. Fifthly, 
God's rising time is his enemy's scattering time, says Thomas Case. Verse 2 speaks of the smoke being driven away. As wax melting before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of the Lord. They will flee away. However powerful and however imposing the enemies of the Lord's people and of Christ himself, they are no match for our God in heaven. The opposition that any mount will melt away like snow and like wax, driven away like smoke, according to the power and the purposes of Christ. Then, although we may be apprehensive and disturbed and troubled, when we hear even in our own country of men and women come to that who with great malice and subtlety seek to uh, promote uh, laws which will be for the persecuting of the church, the silencing of the gospel, uh, the discrimination against Christians, we need not fear. The Lord is the one who ultimately can scatter his enemies in a moment. And we know that from the pages of Scripture. Sixthly, the last point that Thomas Case made from this, these two verses is that it is the duty of God's people to pray him up when he seems to be down. Let God arise. He didn't mean that in any irreverent sense. Like people call a genie out of a bottle. He simply meant that this psalm begins with a call that God should arise and appear on behalf of his people. We may pray for that. We should pay for that. And our, ex our example is here. Have we made this verse the language of our prayers? Perhaps we do not want to know what to do. The forces of atheism and humanism seem to have such a grip and hold upon the hearts and minds of our friends and neighbors and of the whole community of our land, what can we do? Well, we borrow the language of this prayer. We say, Lord, arise, appear for thy people, pour out thy Holy Spirit, equip men who will be faithful preachers, who will declare the truth, Fearlessly, faithfully, raise up those who will be a whole band of witnesses to Jesus Christ, to distribute tracts, to labor for souls, to gather children for Sunday school. But Lord, these things will bring no real effect, no fruit without thy blessing. O oh Lord, arise by the power of thy Holy Spirit. Touch hearts and minds. Bring men and women, young people, to see the reality of eternity, the solemn nature of the judgment day, the great awfulness of their own sin, the loveliness of Christ, the glories of the gospel, the simplicity of salvation. Have we made this our prayer? Let's move on a little bit to the verses that follow. In verses 3 and 4, there is, in the context of the Lord's power over his enemies, a, an expression of joyful confidence. How our forebears must have drawn such comfort from these two verses when they experienced the power of the enemies of the gospel. Men during 1662 and 1663 and 64. You know, in 62, there were, and that was only a generation, almost 18 years after Thomas Case preached this sermon before Parliament, the Five Mile Act was established. And a preacher was not permitted to go within five miles of his place of regular preaching, his congregation. 
unless he signed up to the compromises of the Anglican bishops. He couldn't do it. And there were 2,000 faithful ministers in the uh, Church of England at that time who were turned out of their charges, out of their livings, as they called them, because they preached the faith faithfully the word of God. What comfort they must have drawn from these two verses here. Let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Sing unto God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Jah. That seems to be Jehovah. And rejoice before him. I want to note from this verse, here is a call to praise. But the purpose of praise is not the only purpose, of course. One, the objective purpose, we could say, is to honor the Lord, to magnify his name, to show our love to him. But praise has a benefit to our souls too. Praise imparts strength. It engenders within our souls encouragement, peace, confidence, zeal, purpose. And in the verses that follow, and I'm ha I'll have to share them with you quite briefly, we are given seven reasons to praise the Lord. And praise ought to be part not only of our public worship, but of our private devotions. We praise the Lord for who he is, for what he has done, for what he has yet to accomplish, knowing that when we praise God, it will impart strength to our spiritual character. It will impart strength to faith and love and so on. So let me, we're only going to use the first few verses of this psalm. But firstly, we see here an exhortation to pray God, praise God for his greatness in verse 4. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name. Our God is great. He is far above all the opposition of this world. He is in the heavens. He looks down upon the children of men. The nations are before him, a drop of water in a bucket. They are as nothing, the small dust of the balance, says the prophet. We praise him because we know he is far above all our enemies who are his enemies too. Secondly, we praise him because he is a God of tenderness and mercy and grace. Verses 5 and 6. A father of the fatherless. Perhaps none of us here can imagine what it is to be without a father. The orphan, the fatherless, particularly in lands of great poverty, how vulnerable they are emotionally, physically, how great their needs. But God is a father to the fatherless. Though they may be overlooked and marginalized and abused in this world, God is a father to the fatherless. That's an encouragement to us. In other words, he is a father to even those who are the least respected and noticed in this world. To call him father, it suggests something of great magnitude, doesn't it? If he is to be a father to us, he will defend, protect, love, care, instruct, guide, provide, lay up an inheritance. His fatherless believing people will know and prove his tender love as a father. He is such to all who approach him, however vulnerable they may feel. This is cause for praise. Thirdly, he is to be praised as a God who is righteous. A God who is righteous. The righteous God who delivers the oppressed. 
Verse 6 seems to speak of that. He bringeth out those who are bound with chains. You can think of that in a very literal way. Sometimes the people of God have been imprisoned for their faith. Jeremiah placed in the dungeon. But the Lord is righteous. And ultimately he will not suffer the righteous to perish. He will appear for them. Even though he may permit them to be martyred in this world, then as a God of righteousness, his martyrs will have their reward. Great is your reward in heaven, says the Lord, when men persecute you and vile you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Great is your reward in heaven. What a gospel picture is here in verse 6. When you think about it, if this is a psalm that speaks of Christ and his spiritual kingdom, and as I pointed out at the beginning, it most certainly does, then verse 6 is to be taken in a spiritual sense. He setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains. Many of us here, we've known what it is to be bound by the chains of sin. We've been driven by pride or by resentment towards God, by bitterness at what he has allowed to happen in our lives. We've been driven by lust and by greed and by covetousness. But the Lord has delivered us from that foolish way of life. We've been under the grip of the evil one not literally possessed, but we followed his ways, his agenda, his views, and the Lord has delivered us. He sets the solitary in families. The Lord's people may be solitary people, single, widows, widowers, but we are brought into the family of God. We may be one in a family who loves the Lord, and the rest of our physical family have no time for our faith. But the Lord sets us in his family. And we know that comfort and that, that, that encouragement to being amongst believing people. Brothers and sisters in Christ. If this is what the Lord does, my friends, do we imitate him? When we see those who are solitary, the children of God who perhaps are alone, alone, isolated? Do we welcome them? Do we give them hospitality? Do we imitate our Heavenly Father doing good to the solitary ones amongst us? Fourthly, we praise him because he is the guide of Israel. I'm tempted to make this the last thing that we notice. Look at verse 7. O God, when thou wentest forth, before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness. It's a picture of God as a guide. When Israel were first being delivered from Egypt, you know what the Egyptians said? Pharaoh said this, the children of Israel are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Well, they've escaped from the bondage of these brick kilns. But the wilderness is the other side of the, of the Red Sea. Good luck to them, in a sense, is what he was saying. They'll get lost. It was a waste, howling wilderness. There were no tracks. There was no provision for food, no water. If that's where they want to be uh, redeemed to, good luck to them. But the Lord, this verse says, went before them. They marched through the wilderness. That path that seemed to be so uncertain, so marked by difficulty, bleak, unknown, filled with problems, the Lord went before them and they marched through that wilderness. And sometimes we can say that's how the Lord has led us. He brought us to situations where the future seemed bleak, plagued by problems, by uncertainties, 
no path that was clear. We didn't know how we were going to be sustained. But the Lord was our guide. He took us by the hand. And just as he provided water and manna for those Israelites, we can say the Lord in his faithfulness has been our guide too. What matter then there is here for praise for the Lord's people? I can't finish. There's one more I must mention. Look at verse 13. We didn't read this verse, but it's often perplexed me. And uh, many preachers will say that this psalm, in this psalm there are verses where the precise meaning no one can be sure of. They are the hidden treasures of God's word that will one day be made plain. Though ye have lying among the pots, yet shall ye be as the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. This seems to be a picture of redemption, salvation. The pots here probably refer to the coppers, the copper pots of Egypt, the kilns, the furnaces. And here were the people of Israel oppressed in Egypt, all black and sooty and defiled by their slavery. And yet they were to be emancipated, redeemed, and they would be lifted, exalted, such that they would have the freedom of a bird, but they would be covered with silver and yellow gold, made pure, made precious, and given the heart of a dove, harmless. And, and uh, having the spirit of Christ upon them. It's a picture, probably, I say, of salvation. We praise the Lord for these things. So if we feel weak in faith, if our hearts are cold and our love is languishing this morning, we're lacking zeal, then take up the exhortation of this psalm. Let the people of God be glad. Sing praises unto his name. Extol him. It's in this way that we shall come to know that our God is great and our enemies need not be feared. May the Lord bless his precious word to us. We close with 479.